I'm Juita Gupta, and this is The Pulse. You know, I've never thought about this, not until I started to come in contact with a number of older adults and saw people in my life who used to be able-bodied acquire impairments as they grew older. While I have been congenitally blind and started identifying as disabled when I got to university, I'm genuinely mystified why so many older adults choose not to self-identify as disabled or even go so far as to actively refuse the label. Is it internalized ableism? Is it a desire to push back against ideas of old age being somehow limiting? Whatever the reason, undoubtedly, as the population ages, the linkages between disability and aging grow ever more intriguing. Today, we discuss disability and aging. It's time to put your finger on the pulse. Hello and welcome to The Pulse on AMI-audio. I have to be honest with you, I'm really excited about this particular episode. I have wanted to talk to somebody about disability and aging for I want to say a number of months now, because I have encountered a number of people in my life who, including my parents, who started out self-identifying as able-bodied people, but as they've gotten older, have acquired a number of impairments. Uh, Both my parents, I think they wouldn't mind me telling you, have had cataract surgeries, and you know, my mom now has all these problems with her knee. And that's just my parents, and they would not want to self-identify as disabled, and it it really piqued my curiosity as to why that was the case. Uh, Before we launch into the interview portion of this conversation, I just wanted to remind you that if you haven't already done so, please like this video and also remember to subscribe to the channel. It's a great way to know about future videos uh, that drop on the Pulse channel. We drop new videos every Saturday so that you can get a new video once a week, and I would love if you could tell your friends, family, and co-workers to subscribe to the channel as well. My guest today is Anne Leahy. Anne is a postdoctoral researcher at Maynooth University, and she joins us all the way from Ireland. Hello, and welcome to the program. I'm so delighted you could join us today. Thank you so much. I'm so delighted with the invitation to join you. So I came across your article, Disability Identity in Older Age, Exploring Social Processes that Influence Disability Identification with Aging in Disability Studies Quarterly. Um, Now, that is a bit of a mouthful, but tell me, Anne, how did you get thinking about the linkages between disability and aging? Okay. Um, I suppose I could answer that in a number of different ways, but it goes back to the fact that uh, when I was relatively young, I... I took a job working in an aging NGO, and I found the whole uh, issue of aging to be very, very interesting. Uh, It also meant that I made intergenerational friendships. I had uh, good friends who were a lot older than me, uh, but that meant that, you know, maybe 15 years later, my friends were developing impairments. And I I kind of observed that that was very little explored, really, um, that it was almost denied, I suppose. Um, and another issue was, I suppose, working for an age sector NGO. I thought that us, if you like, and disability sector NGOs might uh, collaborate more. Uh, but in fact, I, I found very little collaboration between the two. So um, there were other other things as well. So I came to do research as very much a mature student with and, and um, you know, those experiences very much influenced uh, my topic, my favorite topic for my PhD. Uh, maybe this isn't the right question to ask, but I am curious about why it even matters if people who are getting older, self-identify as disabled? I mean, even if they choose not to, what difference does it make? Um, I think the my, my PhD study was broader than the issue of identification, uh, but I think it's, it's, it does matter in many ways because 
Uh, we have so much separation, separation in policy framework, separation in advocacy, and it all leads to this non-identification. Uh, but I mean, at a most basic level, the effect of that is that a lot of people who experience impairment or disability uh, are not identifying as disability. So that kind of almost minimizes our perception at a societal level of how pervasive disability is. That's a good point. Tell us a little bit more about your study. As you say, it uh, it doesn't just talk about identification, but uh, give us a bit of a rundown as to the study. You know, what were you trying to accomplish? How did you go about it? And uh, maybe if you have a, a chance, tell us about some of your key findings as well. Sure. Uh, so it, it's a qualitative study. It was largely interviews and it has a number of aspects to it. But I suppose chief amongst them was uh, that I, I wanted to do research to explore processes of disablement and how they were experienced. And I decided on two groups, people aging with longstanding disability and then people who first experience disability in older age. So the terminology in my study is terrible because I keep having to try and distinguish between those two groups. So the first one, the first experience is called aging with disability. And then there's the experience of disability with aging. Um, so it was basically interviews uh, with those groups and other aspects as well. They, so the two groups, even deciding how you put people in the two groups was kind of an interesting one. So oh, I bet, yeah. For me, uh -huh. the um, disability with aging thing, um, they were people who experienced disability after age 45. In fact, most of them experienced disability from their 60s on. So there were 42 participants between those two categories. And and how would you even define a disability? And I was talking about my parents uh, earlier on. Uh, both of them had cataract surgeries. I mean, they can still drive after their cataract surgeries, you know, but that's a very different experience from, say, my mother-in-law who had age-related macular degeneration in her 60s and had to eventually give up her driver's license because her visual impairment had gotten so acute. So how do you actually go about defining disability for the purposes of your study? Yeah, well, that was a huge concern <laughs> for me at the very beginning. It was one of the, it's an astute question because it was, it was something I really grappled with. And I mean, one of the issues, I suppose, is about the separation between the two fields is that within approaches to aging, disability is entirely seen as a medicalized thing. Uh, just, um, you know, it's like the way that disability used to be taught of before social models came to be understood. So I, I, I felt pretty quickly that asking people to identify as disabled probably wasn't going to work in my study. So I had to find some kind of scale or some kind of questionnaire. So there were two ways, really. There was accessing people often through um, stakeholders like uh, older people's groups or groups of people with disabilities. So the, the gatekeepers, if you like, in those groups, they identified people who they thought had disabilities. But I also then incorporated questions at the end of my interviews, which are taken from the Irish um, census. And the questions there are very similar to questions in censuses used all around the world. And again, that's a very debated topic about quite how you define disability, even in a census. Uh, so it asked about conditions, uh, but it also asked about whether uh, those conditions uh, limited you in various ways. And I suppose I, I only um, took people to be disabled, if you like, if they were in some, some way limited, whether that was in terms of daily life at home or going out from their houses, those kinds of things. So you conduct these 42 interviews with people. What were some of your key findings after having all of those conversations? Yeah, I suppose... Uh, some key findings were that even though disability in older age is very much perceived, as I said, in as a narrow medicalized thing, it's something you experience in your body. Uh, but my experience was that in reality, it's a much broader experience than that. So, for example, 
uh, older people with disabilities could be disabled by all the same kinds of things that disable people of all ages. So, you know, footpaths, public transport, all of those things could be experienced um, as disabling. And not only that, but maybe maybe most surprising was the fact that um, people could be othered in in groups, even groups of older people. You know, people could find themselves excluded. Uh, that in some ways is quite a surprising finding. So as I put it, people are experiencing disablism, even, even if they're not identifying as disability or even if they wouldn't label it as disability. Um, the, the other thing just to say about my findings is that people were in a continual process of answering life back, if you like, sometimes resisting those processes uh, that were pushing them out or sidelining them. And uh, they were also trying to, um, you know, have as good a life as they could have. So maybe we think of disability in older age in very reductionist terms. Uh, and in fact, I would say not enough is known about subjective experiences of disability in older age. But people, it's a much more um, challenge. It's a challenging period, but it's also an active period. People are reinterpreting things all the time. It's so true. I think we have such narrow conceptions about old age, you know, the fourth age. And you're, you know, it's almost as though people are in, in decline and they don't have as much to contribute. But it's quite the opposite, at least in my experience, where I've seen a lot of older people really uh, take uh, take life by the horns, as it, as it were, you know, and, uh, and, and be so engaged and so proactive. You know, earlier in our conversation, you mentioned, and you talk about this in your in your research as well, about how it seems that services and programs for people with disabilities are off on one side, and then you've got services and programming for people who are older off on the other side. Why do these silos exist? Yeah, I mean, that's a very good question as well. I mean, they, they exist for, for historical reasons. Um, I, I guess people are living longer now, and that's true of disabled people as well as other people. So in a way, I think disability services were developed mainly with younger disabled people in mind. And activism on disability is often focused on so people of, of working age, for example. So the, the, the two uh, policy frameworks, if you like, got set up as silos. And then that's reinforced by a whole load of things like um, research and scholarship t tends to come from one or other side. Activism tends to come from one or other side without a great deal of overlap, although I think that is beginning to to change. And but now, of course, because people with disabilities are living longer, you have people who are now older having lived with disability for a very long time. Uh, but the, the problem is the research silos. And as far as I know, they exist in most in many countries anyway. They they tend to treat you as if you're older or disabled, not both. Not both, yeah. You mentioned that at least some of the people you spoke to in your interviews were people with disabilities who were getting older. Yeah. I will readily admit that at least as far as I can tell, we don't know a lot about the life experiences of people with disabilities as they get older um, and have to negotiate uh, changing realities that come with age. And I don't just mean, you know, the re just the physical reality of getting older, but, uh, you know, your your... Um, the kinds of pensions you're allowed, the kinds of public supports you get, all of that changes. You often age out of, of public services and programs as well. What uh, did your study reveal, if anything, about the experiences of older people with disabilities and how their interaction with the system changes over time? Yeah, um, I, I have to say I became very fascinated with that group as I started to encounter them. So people who, have, who are now older, say, for the most part, over 65 in my study, but who had lived with disability all their lives. First of all, I realized there was very little research, quite right, with that group. Um, and that kind of surprised me a little. And there's also an assumption, I think, that the experience is extremely different to the other experience. Uh, and I could say, and it is in some ways, but I could say something about that. 
So my so I had 18 people in that category in my study, and I suppose their experiences of aging are very, very diverse. And I don't think that should be a surprise because, you know, disability experiences are very diverse at all ages, and that continues into older age. So, um, I mean, one thing that's really quite interesting is the way that those um, public policy frameworks operate for that group. For some people, it can mean um, going over to a more kind of passive framework, which is how how um, aging policies tend to be approached. You know, again, it's the medical model, less um, supports maybe to live an active life. So there can be a lot of challenges like that, as well as, you know, challenges of additional impairments as well. And I suppose, as I said, there's very little research with that group, but I think that's a really missed opportunity. And I think that has to change because a lot of people aging with disability are doing so with, you know, legacy of disadvantage, as we know from one thing or another, from being excluded from work. And as you say, uh, pension provisions, um, query to what extent they are able to access them. So um, I think it's a, it's a, it's, there's a lot more research to be done there. And my, my research kind of uh, signals, um, signals some of that. One thing you might be interested in, I suppose, which maybe surprises some people is there were quite a few people in my study in that category. Well, there were a few anyway, who had joined older people's groups and actually were quite were quite happy with that. They were now identifying, you know, maybe as older and they felt included in a way that some of them had not at earlier stages. Some of the people in my study had led a very restricted lives. some of them, especially in rural Ireland. Um, you know, they had kind of lived at home most or a lot of their lives and were now in their 80s. But in some ways, um, things were good now for some people. Uh, even if bodily things were harder, and and I wouldn't underestimate that for a lot of people, but in other ways, life was good in many ways. You know, um, that's such an interesting observation, and it does seem very counterintuitive, but perhaps it, it shouldn't. You mentioned a couple of times how when we conceptualize disability in the context of aging, the medical model it seems to be very prominent still which honestly strikes me as a bit surprising because when you think about the last three decades of disability activism, the social model of disability has had a, an ample opportunity to gain ground in our consciousness. Why does the medical model remain the pervasive model to reference disability amongst older adults? Yeah, um, that issue is fundamental to this, this whole area. Um, aging, both studies uh, and public policies, research, if you like, scholarship and public policies are more tied in um, with medicalized understandings far more than disability. Basically, it's to do with the separation of advocacy. So social model approaches, if you like, um, evolved, erupted, you know, caused a revolution in how we think about disability in general. But basically that has never been applied. Um, and it's partly to do with activism on disability, concentrating on, say, children and people of working age rather than on older people, even older people growing older with disability or with lifelong or long term disability. So it's the, the the effect of silos, these separate silos, that means that the that the uh, social model or social models just haven't been applied. Even even things like the UN Convention on the Rights of Older of of People with Disabilities, uh, it tends not to be invoked so much uh, in relation to disability experienced in older age. Uh, it goes back to the thing of, you know, disability in older age being thought of as just impairment then. It's it's just a bodily thing. Yeah. Do you think part of it is also just, I mean, the word disability is not a neutral word. I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to sort of, I don't usually try to take a position, but honestly, the word disability is pretty loaded and it, it does carry a degree of stigma with it. 
Is it a uh, is it also older adults saying that they don't want the the stigma associated with the word disability or being disabled? Yes, I suppose there's some truth in that. Not that people put it exactly like that, but people tended to feel that if they started to use an appliance, say, uh, that other people would look at them differently. Um, so, so they wanted to think of themselves more as part of the mainstream than people who had disabilities. You know, they tended to say, well, look, I've adapted. I can, you know, I've adjusted. I, I use this walker, but it doesn't stop me getting out and things. So I'm not disabled in, in, in that context. But I think the language issue is always an interesting one because um, you can change the language, but it's harder to change the underlying um, prejudice, if you like. Uh, you know, so you can change the word, but if you don't change the underlying prejudice, new words will take on a kind of a, a stigmatized um, connotation as well, I fear. So language is never simple. Um, actually, I do want to add one thing, that issue of people feeling, older people feeling, you know, that they wanted to be part of the mainstream um, rather than, if you like, disabled. That's not unusual, even amongst um, disabled people. You know, lots of studies uh, are a bit like that, that uh, in relation to people, much younger people with disabilities, until they encounter activism, say, um, and get a kind of an empowering view of about what disability can be, then you prob you I'm sure you agree so they don't always want to identify as disabled either. No, no, they don't. It's a it's a fair point. It's not a foregone conclusion that everybody embraces that particular label with open arms. One of the things that uh, you know it's been making some headlines here in Canada, and I'm not sure if it's the case in Ireland as well, but. We've had a couple of news stories here about younger uh, adults with disabilities uh, being accommodated in nursing homes because that's the only place where they can get the kind of care they need. And I know a lot of people with disabilities and disability activists have turned to that and said, this just goes to show you how unsuitable a living situation this is. You've got someone in there maybe... 20s with a disability living with people who are much much older and the prevailing discourse in Canada has been well it just goes to show you you need more supportive housing and you need more housing for people with disabilities as someone who's researched the linkages between disability and aging I wonder what your take on this might be mm, yeah it's an interesting question and it is an issue uh, in a lot of countries actually uh, and I suppose my take on it is I totally agree that um, a nursing home is not is not ideal for somebody in their 20s, 30s, 40s. Um, and so I'm glad to see that there is advocacy to try and put an end to that. However, I do have to wonder then why we think that institutional care is OK from, say, age 65 on, whether that's for people first experiencing disability in older age or people aging with disability. Um, you know, so for me, it's it, I think it raises that question. Why why is there a tacit assumption that a, a, a nursing home or institutional care is OK at any age, really, uh, while at the same time, I, I do very much want to see people uh, younger people not having to resort to that that those kinds of care situations. Um, can I come back and add one thing? I'm sorry, this is pushy of me to the uh, to the um, the earlier question about people not identifying as disabled. I do want to say though that there were people in my study, you know, even people who only experienced disability from their 60s on who did identify as disabled and who did identify as with disability activism. And that was to do with um, encountering it, basically, for one reason or another. Those particular people were, had encountered disability activism, were involved in organizations of one kind or another. And they were, no, I wouldn't say they always wanted to be called disabled. Some of them did, but some of them didn't mind. So that thing of not identifying as disabled, it's not it's not really to do with aging. I think it's to do with the separate frameworks and the siloed approaches to to 
disability and aging. Yeah, so it's also, you know, based on people's sort of thinking about what the genesis of, of, of some of these, you know, like it, what the genesis of a, of a, for want of a better word, what the problem is. Is it an impairment in your body or is it something in society that limits you? There was a really interesting quote from one of your interview participants who says, you know, I used to be able to go to town and visit my kids and, and things like that, and I can't do that anymore. And that's because, uh, you know, transit isn't accessible and that's on that's on the town. It's not on me, you know. So it's it's been really interesting to see how people uh, approach the same situation in so many different ways. One of the things that we're having conversations about in Canada and I suspect in Ireland is actually moving away from the nursing home model uh, especially in light of COVID-19 and uh, in Canada, it was an unmitigated disaster with how rapidly the virus spread in long-term care homes. And so there's a growing movement to say that people who are older should in fact be aging at home and staying in their communities. What benefit does the disability rights movement confer to this idea or this growing realization that people who are older need not, in fact, be institutionalized? Yeah, for me, um, I, I think we're uh, a bit away from people really appreciating that. But um, I would point to uh, the UN Convention, the, you know, older people have human rights to older people with disabilities. And even though they don't tend to be thought of, in connection with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, so I think disability activism has a lot to contribute there. And I, I think uh, disability activism needs to focus on those two groups. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's kind of surprising that, that activism is a bit late coming to focus on the aging of people with longstanding disability. In a way, you would have thought that would a given almost, but it's not um, because they traditionally haven't focused there. But it, I think it is beginning to change and there is more and more of a focus now on um, dementia in particular as uh, a disability. And that didn't used to happen even five or 10 years ago, but that's happening more and more now. Well, it's an ongoing conversation, but we have to leave it here today. And thank you so much for joining me on the program. It was such a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Lahi is a postdoctoral researcher at Maynooth University in Ireland. And that's all the time we have for today. If you have any feedback, if you'd like to share your stories about uh, getting older and having to sort of think through some of those labels and how you self-identify, we would love to hear from you. You can drop a comment down below if you're watching it on YouTube or if you're listening to the podcast. Otherwise, you can write us an email, write to feedback at ami.ca. Give us a call at 1-866-509-4545. That's 1-866-509-4545. Don't forget to leave permission to play the audio on the program. And you can also find us on X, formerly Twitter, at AMI Audio. Use the hashtag PulseAMI. To the, the Pulse is brought to you by a number of people. Our videographer today has been Ted Cooper. Jordan Steves is our video editor. Mark Flalo is our technical producer. Ryan Delahanty is coordinator for AMI-audio podcasts. And Andy Frank is the manager for AMI-audio. And I've been your host, Chuita Gupta. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>